didn't have a last name. So she thought about it and she said, hmm, so dirty true. True sounds pretty good. So she decided to call herself true. So she was so dirty true.
I work in the coal mines of West Virginia to help support my father's meager income. I got you, hold on, you're gonna be number one. <laughs> my schooling was erratic, hungry for education. I was largely self-taught and had mastered common school subjects by the age of 17, entering high school at the age of 20 and completing my diploma in less than two years. In 1926, I began a week-long celebration that has grown into an entire month of February since 1976, dedicated to remembering the achievements, contributions, resiliency, and legacy of black Americans at a time when it was not commonly taught. My colleagues and I created tools that teachers could use in a week-long, now month-long celebration. We created lesson plans, scripts for history plays, educational posters featuring important dates and people in history. I passed at the age of 74 in 1950. My legacy still lives on when we celebrate Black History Month. Who am I? Yes, ma'am. We have our winner.
Grace. Good morning. Are you happy to be here this morning? Yes. Give the Lord a hand of praise. Give the Lord a hand of praise. If you're happy to be here this morning, give the Lord a hand of praise. Amen, amen, amen. It is good to be here. Amen? Amen. Yeah. It's always a good thing to be in the house of God. The Bible says that he's coming back for those who are eager to wait in him. Yeah. So every time we come, we are anticipating his return. Amen? Amen. If you can, please stand with me as we turn to scripture reading. We'll open our Bible to the book of Philippians, chapter 3. Philippians, chapter 3, from verses 12 to 15. If you dare say amen. Amen. Are you faster than me? Philippians, chapter 3. 12 through 15. It reads, it says, not that I have already taken hold of this or have already reached the goal, for I am running hard that I might grab hold of that which I was grabbed by Christ Jesus. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself to have grabbed hold of it yet. But I focus on this one thing, forgetting the things which are behind me and reaching toward the things ahead of me. I am running hard toward the goal for the prize, for the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, as many as are mature, let us adapt this mindset. And if any of you think differently, God will make this clear to you. Amen? Amen. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning, Lord, for waking us up. We thank you for your grace and your mercy. We thank you for your loving kindness. Father, we gather in your presence today, knowing, Lord, that you alone have the answer to our problems. Yes. So speak to us now, Lord, and help us to do your will. In your name I pray. Amen. 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 Please have your seat. I'm this morning to speak to you on the topic, focus. Focus. I know we are continuing our sermon series on the thing, the promises of God or the blessings of God. But today's message is clear under the banner. Focus. Many of you know by now that I was born in Africa, born and raised in Africa. Growing up in my household, there were too many people. I have whole lot of siblings. My father had about 25 children. Yeah, I know Westerners cannot comprehend that. You know, it's a lot of things. 35, yeah. There are siblings of mine that I've never met. So our compound, as they call it back home, when you have more than two or three houses, because we have so many children, we had to build a little up here and there. So and it's fancy, it's called compound. So we don't live in a house, we live in a compound. So our compound was overcrowded. There was people everywhere. Everywhere you turned, somebody was there. And, you know, and, and study has shown that, that there are advantages and disadvantages of growing up in such an environment. Uh, for, the, for, for the convenience of this message, we're going to uh, mention the three advantages of growing up in such an environment. Study has shown that those who grew up in an overcrowded environment, they learn early on in their life, they learn the importance of interpersonal skills. Are you with me? They learn interpersonal skills. They learn the, the importance how to interact with other people, how to be compassionate, how 
to, to be calm and, 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 and persuasive, you, you learn empathy, you learn these things, add it on in your life. Because there's so much people, so many people in your space, you have to learn how to not get life. Are you with me? Yes. You know, a lot of you don't have a lot of siblings like I do, so <laughs> it might sound a little strange, but it's a reality. You learn the importance of human skills, the interpersonal skills. You learn compassion, you learn kindness, you learn how to share with one another. You learn how to care for others. You learn how to deal with people from different ideologies. Another thing you learn early on in your life, you learn the importance of forgiveness. Are you with me? Yes. You're a little quiet on me today. You learn the importance of what? Forgiveness. You learn to self-reflect. You learn unconditional love. You learn how to turn it on the cheek. You learn to walk the extra mile. Because you have so much people around you that you cannot afford to hold on to what people do to you. You see, forgiveness is to set your spirit free. Forgiveness is to turn the other cheek and know that you yourself, at some point in time, did offend somebody. Right. Ask those who don't like to forgive. Have they ever offended someone before? You check yourself. If you have offended someone before, you know that you yourself deserve forgiveness and you need to what? give other forgiveness as well. Amen. And moreover, God says that if we do not forgive those who offend us, he himself will have problem forgiving us. Yeah. That's fair enough. If you don't give, then why do you expect to receive? So you learn, you learn to forgive people because there's so many people in your space, you have to forgive. You cannot, you cannot afford not to forgive others. Every day, every second, every minute, every hour, somebody going to step on your toes. If you continue to hold on to all the hurts, you will have no space to praise God. Wow. Now God man of us come in the church. We are so pretty because we are so preoccupied with unforgiveness that we can't even sing or smile or even enjoy the little things of life. You learn to forgive others. And the third thing I learned growing up in such an environment is that you do not possess the power to control what other people do to you. Can I say that again? Yes. Can I, can I say? Yes. You do not possess the power of what people think of you, what people will say about you, or what people will do to you. You do not have that power. No matter how handsome, no matter how pretty you are, no matter how eloquent you are, no matter who you are, you cannot tell me how I will approach you. That power is not given to you. So when you find yourself in an environment called the church, oh, my family, my family, if you find yourself in that environment, you know that you don't control other people's minds. You don't control other people's attitude towards you. The only power you have is how you respond to them. That's the only power that I have. You can think anyhow about me. You can treat me anyhow. The power that I have is that I will love you anyhow. That's the only power that I have. I will forgive you no matter what. That's the power that I have. I will not control what you do to me. I will control how I respond to you. Come on. The disadvantage are many, but I'm going to need one for the sake of time. The one disadvantage that we, I, I, I realized growing up in such an environment is that it's difficult to focus. Are you with me? If you grow up in an overcrowded environment, it becomes difficult to focus because every time you turn, everywhere you turn, people are in your space. 
There is so much going on, you cannot focus on the task at hand. Wow. It is difficult. It is difficult to focus because everywhere, everyone is trying to get your attention, something going on, and you have to focus and you, you cannot focus, you have to be distracted, what's going on, how can I respond to this, what can I do? And for me, I was the oldest sibling, so I have to take care of everybody. But there was no one to take care of me. I see why God called me to be a pastor. Because sometimes no one cares about the pastor. No one cares about the chaplain. Everyone feels that the chaplain and the pastor, they are superhumans. They got to come to all the families and give the shoulders to cry on. And then you go on, you just got your own problems. You find it difficult to focus. So, so in our text today, in our text today, Paul is trying to tell us and give us a secret how to focus in such an environment. In an environment called the church, in an environment called Christianity, in an environment called Christendom, how do you survive when you are comprised and surprised and, and, and engulfed by people from different walks of life, people from different social backgrounds, people from different political backgrounds, people from different cultural backgrounds? You are called to gather in one little space and interact with one another. How do you stay focused in such an environment? Are you with me? Yeah. So Paul says, I'm going to teach you how to focus in an environment overcrowded. The book of Philippians, for those of you who are biblical scholars, you know that it was written from prison. Paul was captured and placed in prison, and it was from prison that he wrote this letter. If you have the time, it's a one fit, one stop, one fit read. It's three chapters, or four chapters, I believe four chapters. You can sit, just get a little coffee or, or tea, whatever you drink, I don't know. Pop, whatever, put it by you, and you can read it too. It's a very interesting letter, but it's written to a church that he has established. Paul understands that this church is going through crisis. He understands that there are problems, internal problems, and external problems, and he has the right to encourage the brethren. Yes. And Paul writes this letter to the believers in Philip. There is a problem going on. As you read the letter, you realize that Paul. At some point in time, I want to believe that he is attacked because Paul is not just a man who is just focusing on one church. He got churches all over the place. And not only is he doing the Lord's work, he is facing opposition. Well. He talks about principality and power. He talks about the government authority. He talks about a believer or believers who converted from Judaism into Christianity. They are opposing Paul. Wherever Paul goes, they follow him. As you read Paul's letters carefully, you see that he's fighting these people. These people are Jews who converted to Christianity, but their conversion was not true. They believe that even though you are Christian, you still have to have Bible and the Bible laws. They still believe that you have to be circumcised. They believe that you have to go through all the ritual, ritualistic laws of the Jews in order for you to be fully saved. So Paul is writing. To this church, apparently, they call them the Judaizers. Apparently, they have come while Paul is in prison to convince the new believers that now there are some things that you like. It. You need to be circumcised. You need to accept all the Jewish laws in order for you to be holy believers, in order for you to be holy Christian or attain salvation. So Paul writes to them, he said, No, 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 you don't need them. He writes in Philippians, he tells them that, listen, brethren, I do not consider myself to be where God wants me to be. Paul said, I'm not there yet. There are some things that God has called me, and I need to be to where God wants me to be. But for now, I'm not there yet, but there are a few things I want to tell you how to get there. Paul is mapping out the way to salvation, how to stay focused when you are a child of God. Because in this world, we are surrounded by distractions. 
Just look around you. Watch the news. There's destruction everywhere. Just this week, a lady was asking me, how can you tell me that God is love when I'm seeing so much destruction? How do you focus in such an environment? How do you stay on, on, on course in such an environment? Paul understand that he had been attacked. We all know that Paul did not just come from heaven with a clean slip. Paul, once upon a time, as he read this book, he would discover that he called himself a Hebrew of Hebrew, and he lists his credentials. He was once upon a time a Pharisee, a zealous Pharisee who went after Christians. He himself tried to destroy the church. If you are hiring chaplains or hiring pastor for your church, you will never want to hire Paul. Because the man never had a good credential. He was a murderer. So people try to use his past against him. Are you with me? Every one of us got past. Every one of us came from somewhere. The Lord called us to where we are today. And those who kneel you back there, they will they keep watching you. You think they don't know. They're looking at you. They know who you are. And they know who you used to be. And the moment you start to get on their nerve, they're going to remind you. And who you think you are. Sing it in the choir. Girl, you know we need to go down the street. I don't stop playing me. I'm knowing you. They will come after you. So Paul said, yes, I know I used to be a murderer. Yes, I know I used to chase a Christian. I know those things. I'm not naive. So a lot of us are the verge of walking away because we think people know too much about us and they keep telling us what we did yesterday and the day after and the day after and because of that we think we're not good enough. But I start by to let you know today it is God who can call you no matter what you've done yesterday. He can bring you and transform you and use you for his glory. So how do you survive? In an environment that is overcrowded, in an environment that has so many people, and everyone has an opinion, Paul says, Paul says, he says we should adapt. Are you with me? Yes. Paul says that if you're going to survive, you think all Christians down, Christianity. If you're going to survive this thing called the church, you should learn to what? Adapt. Amen. You have to learn to adapt. That's the only way you can survive. In verse 15, 3 verse 15, he said, Therefore, as many as are mature, let us adapt this mindset. Are you with me? Paul is saying that you, that's a sign of, the, of maturity. You need to adapt. You need to adapt some mindset, a kino mindset, a mindset to survive this environment. But the question becomes, what is this mindset that Paul is referring to in the letter? Because Paul says that that's a sign of the maturity. You know, in, in America, when the kids turn 18, the sign of maturity is to have the first BA, the first dream. Thank you, thank you, thank you. God bless you. 21. 21. She said, she said, no, she said, no, chaplain. No, chaplain, you're not right. It's not 18. I, I would have been to my friend, you're not 18. It's 21. 21 is the sign. 21, 21. They can't wait to be 21. Because they feel that when, when you turn to the one, then, then you, you get your first view. It's a sign of maturity. It's a sign that you have you, you are harder now. So Paul is saying that for Christian Christianity, for Christians, there is a sign. There is something that tells everyone around you that you are a mature Christian. It should be. And you ought to know it. Because when I come to you, 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 you have to have fun to work with. You had to look at me, and Brother Ray, and say, is he a mature Christian? Yeah. 
You know what I'm saying? But when you ask the question, you need something to work with because you, 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 you gotta you, to pause or decide for if I am a mature Christian. Right. So Paul says that let me show you what you need to do as a mature Christian. You need to adapt a certain mindset. He called it the kingdom mindset. So what is that mindset? What is that mindset? I'm not going to take much of your time today. Let's go through it. Paul said, a kingdom mindset, the first thing you need to do, the first thing you need to know, to know that this person is a mature Christian, is those of us who are mature to live behind the past. Are you with me? Paul said, you cannot survive this environment if you are continuing, you continue to hold on to the past. Yeah. He said that, listen, I do not consider myself to have apprehended these things. I do not consider myself to be where God wants me to be. I am running my way. But you ever think, there's one thing that I do, I let go of the past. I do not hold on to my past. I do not hold on to the things I did yesterday and the day before and last year and the year after. Paul said, I let it go. It's a mindset that we all need to adapt. Because the enemy, the enemy, the greatest weapon that the enemy uses against us is our past. Right, right. Paul understands that. Paul knows that the devil will never use your future, he use your past. A lot of people walk away from Christianity because of their past. They think they're not good enough. Paul says, adapt this mindset. Leave your past behind. Because you cannot change the past. You cannot go back in the past and change and not do the things that you did. You hurt people? Yes, I understand. People hurt you? Yes, I understand. But guess what? You are here right now. Yes. You survive. You survive the sexual abuse. You survive the enslavement. You survive the castigation. You survive the alienation. You survive all these things. Paul says, you hear right now. Let it go. Let that your past define who you are. Are you with me? Don't do it in the past. Now watch this, watch this. If David has lived in the past, would he be the great, great, great grandfather of Jesus? Would Jesus ever be proud and say, I am the son of David? No. You think about it when David slept with Bathsheba and killed her husband. And David said, You know what? I'm done with this thing. I'm walking away. He said, God ain't here with your crown. I'm done. I'm not good enough to be a king. Will he be called the father of Jesus? No. He got up. He dust himself up. He cried to God and he started walking. He put his chest up and said, Lord, give me the right spirit. Lord, create the right spirit in me. Lord, do not take your spirit away from me. Lord, I see that gives you. Wash me clean, Lord. Paul says, let the power stay in the some of you, you're driving, you don't focus on the road, you focus on the, on, on the view mirror. Keep looking at what is in the past. No. No. The view mirror is stunning because it's, it, 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 that should not be your focus. You should drive and focus ahead of you. So Paul says, don't be driving and keep focusing in the view mirror. What is in the past is in the past. What is back there? Let us stay back there. If somebody bring it up, tell you, say, you know what? I'm not a person anymore. If someone tried to put you down because of what you did, I'm not a person anymore. Paul said, let the past be the past. I forget those things we are behind. He says in the text. And the next thing of mind said that Paul tells us to adapt. Paul said we should keep running. He said, keep running. Paul said, don't stop. Never do stop running. Because somebody says something or somebody did something to you, keep running. Do not stop. It is the enemy plan to make you to stop your race. Paul said that I consider this thing, this one thing. I forget what is in my past and I consider what is before me. 
et tu détestes. I forget about my past and I consider the reason that before me God has called me to something. God called me to ministry. God called me to be a believer. God called me to be a Christian. God called me to be a choir, a musician. God called me to work for him. I'm going to focus on what God called me to do. Paul says, I let go. And your faith is not a sprint. It's a miracle. It's not how fast you go. But will you get to the finish line? Are you with me? It's not how fast. Some of you been in the church for 40 years, 50 years, 60 years. You still running? You still running? Every day you wake up, you put on your running shoes, and you keep on running because you know it is not over until it's over. It's a miracle. I stop out to let you know it is a sign of maturity waking up every morning saying the same old prayer. Lord, I've been saying that prayer for seven and years. I'm tired. No, you don't get tired. Keep saying it. Keep praying to him. Keep pressing him. Keep thinking to him. Keep reading your Bible. Keep running. Paul said, I consider that. I forget the things in the past. I consider what is before me. Because I know I'm going somewhere. Yes. And the Paul said, I focus on the price. Yes. 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 Paul says that as I forget the things in the past yes. and consider what is before me, my mind, in my mind, I know there is a price. That when I get to the finish line, there is a price for me. That's what I keep, that's what keeps me going. That's where my mind is. My mind is on the price. So I'm not distracted by what is going on in the midst of my, 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 my brain. I'm not distracted by what people are doing around me. I am completely zoomed in on the price. Question becomes, what is the price that Paul is talking about here? Paul tells us in the text, if you read the text, Paul is telling them that, listen, the price is Jesus Christ. The price is the second coming of God. The price is that when he appears in the cloud of glory, this corruption shall put on incorruption, this mortal shall put on immortality, and those who are dead in Christ will rise first, and those of who are alive will be transformed, and will all shall be caught up in the air. He knows that. He said, I want to be part of his resurrection. I want to share in his resurrection. I want to share in the power that raised Christ up. Paul said, that's my focus. Because he knows. The Bible says on that day. He said, he said, he said, the Lord himself will descend with the shout of an angel. You see, you need to understand what they been saying, what Paul is saying to, 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 to believe on the New Testament. He said, the Lord himself. Yes. During ancient times, when the king wanted you to come see him, he sent messengers. The king never leave his body for anybody. So if I want you to come see me, I sent for you. Are you with me? That's how important the king is. He does not leave the throne. He sent for you to come see him. You come to the king, but watch this. When Jesus is getting ready for you, yeah. uh, I wish I put you to a church. Yeah. Yeah. It just been one again. When Jesus is getting ready for you, yes. Yes. somewhere in the Bible it says that I'm going to prepare a place for you. And when I go to prepare the place for you, I will come again. And where I am, that's where you should be. So when he gets ready for you, he's not sending no angel, he's not sending no messenger. The Bible says he himself is coming. That's how important you are. That the King of glory, the Lord of love, the Yahweh, the I am that I am, the Alpha and Omega. The beginning and the end. The one who spoke the war in existence. He loved his so much so that he will leave the throne and come receive you to himself. Yes. 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 
Paul said, that's why I do what I do. That's why I'm not distracted by anything people say to me. I'm not distracted by anything they do to me because I want to be part of this procession. I want to be with the Lord. I want him to receive me. I want him to transform me. I want him to tell me, well done, my good and faithful servant. I want to be there when he tell death, all death, what is your victory? All death, what is your power? All death, what is your authority? I want to hear it. I want to feel it. I want to be right there with Jesus when he finished that death. In my presence, I want to be there when he wept away all tears from my eyes. I want to be there when he said that there would be no more pain, there would be no more crying, there would be no more tears, there would be no more sorrow because the Lord Himself shall wipe away tears from your eyes. I want to be there, and I will not allow you, nor you, nor you, nor you to stop me from being. I will not let it. So Paul says that, adopt this mindset. Yes, sir. Yes. Yes. Adopt. He said, take it, make it your own. He said, that's how I survive the noise around me. That's how I survive bad leadership. That's how I survive the vast power. That's how I survive World War children. I do not allow any of them to distract me. Because I want to be there. I want to be there when he comes. I want to hear him call my name. I want to, no matter what I'm alive or dead, I want to hear him call my name. Yes. So because I have this in my mind, I'm focused. I'm focused. The question becomes, are you focused? Are you focused this morning? This is the price to be one. This is the price in Christian love. Do not run a race and not get the price. Do not run in vain, brothers and sisters, because the enemy knows that he can distract you and you can miss out on this. So Paul is saying, if you will make it in the kingdom, you need a kingdom mindset. Let it go. Yes, sir. Keep running and keep the price in your mind. Because at the end of the day, nothing matters but this. Are you with me? Everything that we work for, everything, relationship, love, and money, everything we work for, the Bible says, it will burn. Are you with me? Yeah. The Bible says everything you have ever acquired, it will burn. The only thing that will survive is your salvation. Yes. If you focus and stay focused and not allow the enemy, and not allow the enemy to take you off track. There are too many things happening today. I love social media, don't get me wrong. But I also pray for our young people who are not grounded in the world. Because there's so That's many people who have their own interpretation out there trying to convince our young people that there is no God. And they have so many followers. And because today, the more followers you have, the more authority you have. So if this man has two million followers, then he must be saying something relevant, something important. Right. But the Bible says, God is the way that leads to destruction. Yeah. Narrow is the way that leads to eternal life. So because too many people embrace an idea that doesn't make it right. That's what the Bible says, study and know and show that's ever true. If you're not studying God's word, the enemy will completely take you out of trap. Because sometimes the people who try to get you off track are the people that are more eloquent. Yes. Are you with me? Yes. They, they are well articulate. So because you're not sophisticated, they can convince you that there is no God. 
that all you have is his life. So live it rather than we until it falls off. But that's not about the legend of today. He's coming. Are you with me? He will come. No matter how long it takes, he will come. Amen? Amen. Because let no one tell you that God will not come. No one preached for 120 years. To this sign, they still wrestling with the fact that, oh, there was no flaw, oh, there was a but there was a different kind of flaw. No, the Bible said there was a flaw. God destroyed this place. And when Noah said it, like me standing before you today, people looked at him like he was crazy. Yeah. They thought he was not sophisticated. But the day came, and the ark was locked. And the bank on the doors, well, there was one door, they go on the But there was no way for them to enter. Because it was too late. My appeal to you today is very simple. If you're here today, and you say, well,